talking about the trends that we're going to see upcoming in this uh, this particular industry. Um, but um, you know, before I look at trends and and uh, you know what we're going to uh, to accomplish, uh, I always like to look at what challenges uh, these uh, these industries have. So um, you know, what do you what do you guys foresee as being the most pressing challenges for the business services industry today? I'll throw it out there. To you. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so for, we'll start with you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah. So, so um, for me, it's it's um, I guess it's still getting people to actually engage in conversations. It's uh, mm-hmm. it, it's getting in front of people, getting talking to people. I still think we're we're in this um, interim. People think it's post COVID, but it's kind of not. We're just hopefully coming out the back end of it. And I feel that uh, still within within services, actually getting in front of people and talking to people about the future of their business um, in various areas it is still um, some uh, some things that certain businesses are not currently looking at. So just getting people to open up and, and look to the future rather than coping with the current is uh, is definitely something outside of software and et cetera. It is uh, something that's going to have to work better over the next 12 months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that's a great point, Daniel and and Julian. What are what are your thoughts? What are you seeing with your customers as you're talking to them? What are their uh, what are their biggest challenges? The, the biggest challenges uh, which uh, we see uh, in a, in a different uh, ways uh, currently. Uh, one of them, of course, is with this uh, COVID uh, situation, is uh, we how to say we lose the the ability to to talk in person. And uh, this is really, uh, even for, for us, even for our customers, it makes our life difficult. The, uh, what I'm facing, for example, is, yeah, online is fine. Uh, you schedule something and so on, but uh, if you're offline, even with uh, employees or with, with uh, uh, customers, you can catch some minutes, discuss something, solve something and so on, but with online, always somehow fixed, let's say, in portions of 15 minutes or 30 minutes. And then you have five minutes where you do almost nothing. Okay, you can read something, but you can you cannot solve things because this personal relation and, and personal contact is, is lost. This yeah. is something which I see really as a, as a big, uh, big deal in this COVID situation. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think that lends itself to, to Daniel's point as well, right? It's, um, you know, the communication and how do we communicate and how do we uh, create those business relationships in this digital environment that we're, uh, you know, we're moving towards. And, and to your point, Daniel, you know, hopefully we're, we're coming out the end of it, other end of it. And, um, you know, we're moving more uh, towards a, a normal engagement model. Um, however, I think that because we've been able to um, you know, remain productive throughout this as well. Um, you know, I think that we'll probably see some sort of hybrid engagement going forward. And um, you know, when when I'm talking to customers and and uh, you know, it's it's a great way for them to you know control costs, control um, you know internal resources. Um, you know, I think that one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing is is uh, you know control and compliance with all of these digital engagement. Um, uh, uh, you know, channels that we have now with customers, you know, how do you stay on top of compliance? How do you uh, ensure, um, you know, that those engagements are, are going to uh, stay within your, your control? So it'll be interesting to see how that, uh, that, that pans out in the next, uh, you know, few months. Uh, so we know that, um, you know, with, with the pandemic, uh, you know, to your, to your point, Julian, um, it really shifted the way that uh, you know people had to do business, right? So uh, you know, it's particularly in business services, you know, you move to a you know kind of work from anywhere model, uh, customer experience, uh, you know, digital customer experience, digital employee experience as well, right? Uh, employees had to learn how to uh, you know work remotely. Uh, so we know that those were the trends that you know have been affecting us over the last you know almost two years now. Um, what do you see as trends that are, are, are going to be impacting us as we move forward, uh, you know, from this, you know, good or bad? And, um, you know, how can, you know, how can business service uh, organizations, uh, you know, stay ahead of that and also, uh, you know, maybe take advantage of trends that are going forward? What are you guys seeing? I mean, from my perspective, 
as businesses are sort of settling down into a, a new way of working in a sort of a, a, a soon to be post COVID kind of environment, um, what, what we're seeing is that people are um, being affected by almost a stealth AI function. You know, you look at um, software like TikTok, for example, and it's driving very specific content related to those consumers of that actual application um, directly to them. Um, and, and it's always constantly learning. It's always evolving. Um, so for me, it just seems to be full of golf. Um, <laughs> so lots of uh, lots of golf things on TikTok um, because it's already learned. I don't have to tell it anything. It knows what I'm interested in. Um, and I think that as, as AI becomes more and more prevalent in applications, uh, from the from the business um, sort of processes side and the business services, being able to deliver uh, business services that don't require as much configuration um, and through obviously with the low code no code kind of scenario we can we can deliver that a lot quicker. But actually having applications and having the business itself learn automatically what people are after, what information they're after, uh, and, and not have to have them go hunting for it. So it's actually seeing things be much more. Um, data driven for example uh, logging into an account system um, I would log in and uh, I want to see maybe my profit and loss I want to see my my um, sales for the month where someone else logging in might want to see the amount of invoices or the amount of bills we've got in the system uh, we shouldn't have to tell it that that's what I want to see the fact that I'm looking at that more often should automatically drill that content straight onto my screen in a way that the sort of b2c consumer applications do at the moment mm-hmm yeah, yeah, I would agree. Julian, what are your thoughts on that as well? I think, you know, data driven uh, is a huge trend, right? We have to, uh, we have to leverage all of this data that we're, we're, we're collecting. Now, how do we make it actionable? Yeah, uh, I, I have to agree with, with Daniel that the AI uh, will help in this uh, situation. But uh, the other trend which uh, I would uh, see as a kind of uh, growing uh, Especially here in uh, in our region is uh, uh, e-identity because uh, uh, everybody has to to implement kind of uh, e-identification to know the who exactly the customer is because yeah from from one side this uh, digitalization I would say is uh, nice but from other side uh, a lot of threats are coming with with all this uh, uh, topic. And uh, one of the solutions, for example, to know that, that how to deal with the customer or with the person in front of you, because now, now we have our cameras switched on, but mm -hmm. I'm participating in a uh, lot of meetings where the camera are not switched on. You have no idea with whom I'm talking with. And, right. and this uh, e-identity, I think, uh, will be the trend uh, which will be very fast implemented in, in any kind of the services because to, to be, to, to, to trust to the person with whom you're working or discussing, you, you have to know and you have to be sure that this is exactly the, the right person. I'd say that this is also a kind of trend which we will see really boosting in, in next uh, months. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great point, actually. That's um, that's already starting to emerge in the banking industry, for example, where, where bankers are working remotely more often, being able to identify them as the person that's doing that particular trade on the stock markets, wherever they're working in is a very a very key point at the moment, and something that's yeah, definitely, definitely going to expand out into the uh, into the, the sort of more B two B market. Definitely, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to think about, right? <laughs> as we uh, as we uh, expand into these new business models, we have to uh, uh, think about all kinds of different uh, compliance and in ways to verify. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. Um, you know, another thing that, uh, you know, when I think of business services and, and service organizations, um, you know, this is a heavy, um, you know, people driven industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when we yeah. think of, um, you know, the employee experience and, and also, you know, challenges with, um, you know, recruitment and retaining, uh, you know, talent in the services industry, that's always something that has to be on top of mind for these, uh, these organizations as well. Um, you know, we know that we have to uh, empower employees, you know, we've, employees, you know, they come on board, they stay on board because they feel empowered. Uh, they want to do a good job. But if we're not providing them with modern tools, um, I think that it's, uh, you know, one of the challenges I see is how do we, how do we attract new talent and retain our existing talent as well. Um, and when employees are empowered, if you look at it, um, you know, Forbes, uh, had a study out there that said, you know, highly engaged teams 
are 21% more profitable um, than teams that are not engaged. So obviously there's a, you know, there's definitely a business benefit to that. Um, but how do we get, uh, you know, business uh, service organizations to embrace that? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? How do we drive that culture within uh, organizations? I mean, for me, I could probably talk about this topic for hours. Um, but uh, but if, if I pick up maybe one or two key points, um, I, I see the, 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 the no-code, low-code, the AI, and all of this kind of um, stuff that's coming out and, and people are using a lot more at the moment. Um, to really, the, the benefit of that ultimately is to detach people from the technology. Mm -hmm. It's to make sure that the people are doing the job that they're employed to do, such as going out and talking to customers. Or, or fixing something on site or doing whatever it is within that industry that's generating the actual revenue. Um, and so therefore, if they're actually interacting with a system in some way, it's taking their, the, their money away from the business for what they're actually employed to do. So by using AI and tech, et cetera, we can streamline that process and actually have people interacting a lot less with the technology and mm -hmm. actually doing the job that they want to do. Um, and are employed to do, and that's that's what they came on board to do, rather than having to fill in. Uh, I know on our, our talk earlier on in the week, I was mentioning about people spending loads of time filling in forms, and it's obviously the old age-old um, CRM kind of uh, thing that uh, no one likes doing, but really just trying as much as possible to stop people having to log in and automate as much as possible in the back end to allow them to get on with doing what they're employed for. Um, and also, you know, if you look at... Um, uh, if you look at the actual revenue models, for example, of, of businesses, um, the, the over the years, over the past couple of years, especially the sort of SaaS subscription model has revolutionised the uh, the software area, and it's made businesses more stable and more sustainable with their ongoing revenue. And there's been some benefits, obviously, to customers as well, where they have a a, a, a constantly evolving, constantly developed system because more money is being put in on the R and D, etc. Uh, and that kind of um, that kind of stability for software vendors to be confident to keep growing their product and growing their, their base um, is, lent, is starting to move or quite rapidly moving into almost a subscription services model where people are paying a, a fee for a certain amount of time each month or each year, which allows them to budget better. It allows them as a customer to um, know that they can keep this continual involvement of, of their CRM system or their business processes constantly going as they change and as their business changes, but also for the actual um, the actual supplier, it allows them to more accurately budget um, the, the amount of money they've got coming in and therefore what staff they can bring on, and also then using the, the technology to understand where the uh, potential work's coming up from. So I know that I've got projects coming up in two months' time, so I can actually start to go on a recruitment drive a lot earlier and give me enough time to recruit the right people into the right roles. Well, like I said, I could talk about it for a long time as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. That's uh, great points. What, what are your thoughts, Julian? Uh, just to confirm, uh, today I read a study here uh, for, for local market. Uh, we are uh, facing something like 30% more uh, leaves of the employees from the companies comparing with the uh, situation one year ago, which means that... Uh, uh, yeah, from uh, it really makes the, the employment uh, and the retention very difficult because it's uh, one thing when the person is into the office, uh, you can you can get personally engaged with him and so on and so on and, and to, to retain him. Then comparing with his uh, sitting at home, uh, being uh, online, of course, this all depressions and things like that, which are facing also from medical point. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just to confirm that uh, it, it happens. And from other side, uh, the, the technology is really the, uh, the turn key point, I would say, because uh, imagine uh, how we would uh, face this if the cloud was not exist, for example. Right. It, it would be a nightmare. Uh, means that every, everybody has to stop to do whatever he did. But now with the cloud and all these possibilities, because what also cloud, cloud brings us is a, uh, a lot of the really small and very tight solutions, which you can very fast integrate in the business area or business process or whatever else. And then you can have a, a long cycle and really make your, your life easier. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is kind of 
I would say, a very huge advantage, which also allows us uh, and employees allows employees also to, to to perform better and well. Because without, without this possibility, I think uh, it would be much much harder comparing with today. But mm-hmm. somehow we were ready. The, the industry really was ready for such a such a situation. Yeah, very, very resilient. And um, uh, <laughs> with a few minutes that we have left, um, you know, when we're looking at that, um, you know, where do you think uh, service organizations should be investing in order to be able to uh, innovate and uh, and kind of stay ahead of the curve? I mean, that's that's um, a tricky question, obviously, because there's a lot of different sectors that um, business services industries work in, and, and they've got their own very unique ways in which they can do stuff. Um, but, but in general, you um, you know, it, companies um, see IT and see tech as, as something that they do to manage their teams or manage their reporting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they need to embrace that technology and, and cement it in the core of their business and put a lot of effort into using the technology that they're investing in to actually help drive whatever process they see as the, the best next steps for their business. It's having having implemented CRM systems for many years, it's quite sort of upsetting to see people invest both time and money on both sides into a system and then use 20% of what that product can do. You know, they've invested the money in it. It's got all of this really cool stuff that it can do. Um, and, and they're all really you know, traditionally what a lot of companies do is they use it to put some companies and addresses and some notes in and a couple of documents. Mm-hmm. Taking that technology that they're investing in, looking at all this really good. AI stuff and user-driven process um, kind of interactions that they can do now and, and using that to drive forwards and automate their uh, their processes in their business that they've always wanted to or they can see that they're going to benefit. Great point, great point. Julian. I would say that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, from my point of view, uh, it, it depends because each business is different. Mm-hmm. But uh, but uh, what, from my point of view, should be the key driver where exactly to invest is uh, where I will get the the highest speed. I would say mm-hmm. it could be uh, AI or RPA or low code, no code, but something which will bring me uh, ability to be faster, to to deliver faster, and to and to be also flexible. Uh, this is from my point of view the the the. the main uh, driver for decision speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, guys. And I think, yeah, the key messages are this, right? If we're looking to the future, we have to be adaptable. We have to leverage the data that we're, uh, you know, collecting, uh, use data-driven insights to make better decisioning going forward. Automation, right? The more we can automate, the better, uh, you know, the better off we're going to be, the more efficient we're going to be. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a great path to the future, right? Because we understand that there's going to be multiple disruptors. Uh, you know, things are going to happen, competition, different things. But um, if we're able to stay out ahead of that, um, you know, usually good things happen. All right. Well, Julie and Daniel, it has been a pleasure. I'd like to thank you both for joining us. Uh, I know it's uh, it's getting later in the day for you guys, and I'm standing between you and the weekend. Uh, so uh, thank you again, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll see you next week at uh, some of our sessions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks.